In January 2011, a private Bombardier Global Express jet was soaring across the Caribbean on its way to the Dominican Republic. On board was Canadian billionaire Michael G. De Groot. After a lifetime of lucrative business deals in Canada and abroad, he was looking for new investment opportunities. He was about to launch a bold casino gambling venture with two brothers from Toronto, Francesco and Antonio Carbone. I can actually say to you that at one time, uh, Michael De Groot was a second father to me because I spoke to him two and three and four times a day and he was a voice in my ear, a thought in my head. On his private jet at the beginning of this venture, the brothers say Michael De Groot played the gracious host. Oh, it was beautiful. Comfortable, drink service. There was even a, he says, if you want to take a nap, Frank, you can go lie down in my bed. I put it in on purpose. I said, no, it's okay, I'm okay. Michael De Groot and the Carbone brothers were immediately touring the larger casinos on the island. The idea was to buy up casinos, bring them up to modern standards, and turn them into a Caribbean version of Las Vegas, a money generator of stunning proportions. He was very eager to do this business, because obviously he knows where the money is. Everybody gambles. In good times or in bad times, everybody gambles. The casino gambling business has a bad reputation in the Caribbean. There has been a long history of mafia involvement. For decades, cash that was raised through prostitution and drug sales has been washed through casinos here. And the islands have been used as a transit point for South American drugs being shipped north. What's more, the Carbone brothers had a questionable background, including recent convictions for possession of unregistered handguns. They say De Groot was not worried about it. No, not at all. De Groot moved here with armed guards. Not at all. Guns by no means made Mr. De Groot nervous at all. Regardless of their checkered past, down in the Dominican Republic in 2011, the Carbone's new company, Dream Corporation, was created. Michael De Groot advanced more than $10 million to start buying casinos around the country. Before long, there were 5,000 employees and a new corporate jet to run the brothers around, a $2 million Hawker 800. Through the winter and spring of 2012, Michael De Groot continued to pump money into the purchase and renovation of gaming facilities, a total of $112 million. What happened to that $112 million Michael De Groot lent the Carbone brothers is now the central question in a legal battle being fought out in the Ontario courts. The shining Caribbean dream would turn into a nightmare. There would be accusations of bad faith, fraud, and even conspiracy to murder. The court record includes hours of audio tapes in which you can hear both sides plotting against each other. How did one of Canada's richest and most successful businessmen get into this mess? De Groot says the trouble started in September 2012, when he first heard rumors that the Carbones were cheating him. De Groot claims that he heard that the brothers were overpaying for casinos and renovations and pocketing kickbacks. He testified, I was told that the Carbones were stealing, that the Carbones were skimming off the top and bumping up expenses in the middle. The Michael G. De Groot Senior School. When the public sees Michael De Groot, he's almost always giving away money to worthy causes, making large contributions to schools and especially to Hamilton's McMaster University, which is named buildings after him. On May 10th, 2013, however, there was a private meeting at the De Groot family luxury suite on the 44th floor of the Ritz-Carlton building in Toronto, where a very different side of the billionaire was in evidence the esteemed business leader decided to go to war with the Carbone brothers. Here he met with two former Carbone associates. The first is Peter Schoenacher, a former Ontario Crown attorney who had his license to practice law revoked in 2008 after his conviction in a money laundering scheme. The second is a man introduced to De Groot as Sasha Visser, who has a long criminal record and was out of jail less than a year. We found out that Sasha Visser also goes by the name Pavla Kolik with a Croatian passport to match, and the name Sasha Vujicic with a Canadian passport. 
and the name Zeliko Zderek with a Bosnian passport. He has served time for more than 40 criminal convictions in Canada for fraud, impersonation, assault, and uttering death threats. Sasha Visser made a secret audio recording of the meeting in which the men discussed how to take down the Carboni brothers. That's what we're going to do. Well, let's, let's put it this way. No two jackasses like that. I shouldn't be around. I shouldn't be in business. Well, they shouldn't be around is, fine bags. is an understatement, right? Absolutely. And here's the deal. I'm going to make sure that the Carbones can't even sell chestnuts on the corner of the fucking street. Well, hopefully you'll be in jail by then. Fuck jail. What about Jail's the, too nice. Uh, Ten minutes later, Sasha Visser is offering to Groot his services as an enforcer. Look at me. Look at me. I need half a million to secure my family. I'm going to go to war for you. Do you know what war means? I'm going to go to DR, where I'm going to carry a gun with a license, and I'm going to change everything in their world. The talk at the meeting turns to buying evidence against the Carbones. The price discussed is $500,000. The meeting continued the following day after De Groot's lawyer advised him that buying evidence was illegal. Then De Groot is recorded hiring Sasha Visser for unspecified duties. Give me your wiring instructions. Where to send the money to. Okay. No strings touched. I'm not buying anything right now. But you'll keep it in mind in the future. I'm going to send you $150,000 Monday morning for nothing. Okay. Near the end of the Ritz meeting, things take a darker turn. De Groot seems to want to clarify whether or not they are talking about actually murdering the Carbones. Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you like to see these cocksuckers safe? And do you want to make it so they'll never get off a plane? That they're not that they're not welcome to the Dominican Republic. Oh, you don't know, you know, mean wiping them out? No, 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 no. Oh. But he can, you know, he can. Listen, do. whatever you want done for me, when when you tell me what you want done, you'll get done everything that you ask. Okay. I don't care what it is. The threats of violence would become quite personal. Dream Casino president Andrew Pajak was caught on tape over several days saying he was going to protect his old friend Michael De Groot, boasting that he would hunt down the Carbones. This is what they've done. I, I like to put a fucking gun right down the mouth of the boat and fuck your hands off. And the trainer, they're, they're, they're hoping they can kill this guy because of the stress because he's got cancer, he's 80 years old. Honest to God. The feeling was apparently mutual. De Groot learned that the criminal Sasha Visser had previously offered his services as a hitman to Francesco Carbone and taped that exchange. The intended target was Dream Casino president Andrew Page. What do I have to make Paycheck look like? Like just a shooting or just like a... Really it doesn't make any difference. After I do what I have to do, bro, they can stop, they can ask me whatever, I don't know, just do it, just not. But can we lock them in the Dominican? They can't kill them in the Dominican. It's worse, bro. Why? It's worse, bro. Because it'll fucking get every fucking paper. So Michael de Groot knew Sasha Visser was offering his services as a hitman, knew of his multiple identities and criminal record, and yet decided to go ahead and have money sent to him anyway. He later denied it, but CBC News recently obtained this bank transfer from De Groot financial associate Ivan Cairns to a Canada Trust account jointly held by Sasha and his girlfriend. The amount was $500,000. The date was August 1, 2013. On that date, Sasha Visser showed up in the Dominican Republic. This is security video of him in the Punta Cana Casino. Dream Corporation would soon give him a legal power of attorney to act on its behalf. He started making death threats to a Dream employee there and also left threatening messages on Antonio Carbone's phone. Anthony, can you imagine if somebody attacked your family, your wife or something, would you not answer the phone too? Like, come on, you're a big point. You don't live in some gated community, buddy. What's your reaction when you're What's here? What's my when reaction? What am I going to do except report it to the police? It, 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 that's exactly what I did. You just go on full alert. You become now on full alert. Mm -hmm. 
you watch your surroundings, you drive your kids to school, you do everything that is possible to protect your family. In that, it's, the in th that it's the only thing I could do. What else could I do? In August 2013, a mysterious new player appears with Sasha Visser at the Punta Cana Casino. The legendary mafia godfather Vito Rizzuto was being enlisted by the De Groot side for their war against the Carbones. Rizzuto had recently been released from prison after serving a long sentence for murder. He maintained a residence in the Dominican Republic and had business interests there. The Carboni brothers believe Vito Rizzuto was brought in to scare them. When you come from an, an Italian background, you know who Vito Rizzuto is. You don't have to Google him, for God's sakes. Because with a name like Vito Rizzuto, the people fear that name. So he was brought in to intimidate you? 110%. No, he was brought in to intimidate us. An amazing chapter in the Dream Casino story would unfold in an affluent gated community in the Dominican Republic, Casa de Campo. The Mafia godfather Vito Rizzuto had long maintained a mansion here. He apparently lined up this house at 24 Barranca Oeste Street for the exclusive use of the new Dream Casino operative, the convicted criminal Sasha Visser. Sasha Visser was living at this house in Casa de Campo when he was working for Dream Casinos. He didn't have to go far to look for help from the notorious mafia godfather. Vito Rizzuto was living right across the street. We wanted to ask Sasha Visser about his relationship with Vito Rizzuto, and so we tracked him down to this hotel in Santo Domingo. I just landed. Yeah. I'm going to call you guys. I'm okay. preparing everything. Peter Schoenberg Sasha... will be here. Listen, I know, listen guys. I we were waiting. Like... You said you were going to come. When CBC you producer Harvey Cashor approached yeah. him on the because street, he was very Sasha, unhappy Sasha, about it. So tell me about Vito Rizzuto. Yeah. Are you a made man? We've been told, sources have told us you're a made man in the, the, the mob. Get the fucking camera out of here because no. I do have some connections. Get the fucking thing out of here. What do you mean you have connections? Yeah. What do you mean you have connections, Sasha? What does that mean? Are you trying to, what are you no, suggesting you by that? I don't want to be filmed. In September 2013, Michael DeGroote's good friend, the Dream Casino president, Andrew Pajak, arrived in the Dominican Republic by private jet. He had meetings with Sasha Visser and Vito Rizzuto at an Italian restaurant in Casa de Campo and at the Rizzuto mansion, apparently discussing the possibility of the Mafia godfather getting involved in Dream Casinos. Peter Schoenacher was there and says he was distressed about what was going on. He claims he sent Michael DeGroote a message through an intermediate. I said, I think somebody better get the straight goods to Mike and tell him congratulations, you're now in bed with the mob. Before his involvement in Dream Casinos could be formalized, Vito Rizzuto suddenly died of cancer in a Montreal hospital in December 2013. We asked Michael DeGroote about the involvement of Vito Rizzuto. His lawyer answered, Mr. DeGroote has never met Mr. Rizzuto, has never spoken to him, and has never had any association with him of any kind. He also said Mr. DeGroote has never been complicit in members of organized crime becoming involved in any of his business affairs. Since our documentary first aired, new information emerged which calls into question Michael DeGroote's honesty. In October of last year, DeGroote was asked under oath if he had sent money to the criminal Sasha Visser. He repeatedly and categorically denied it, saying, I have not paid anything directly or indirectly for Mr. Visser. However, in a new document obtained by CBC News, De Groot is contradicted by his own financial advisor, Ivan Cairns, who wrote, at the request of Mr. Michael De Groot, we did on August 1, 2013, wire transfer $500,000 to an account at TD Canada Trust. When we approached Mr. Cairns about the money transfer, he did not wish to discuss it. What don't you understand? I said I'm not going to make any comment. Peter Schoenacher says he is shocked by Michael DeGroote's sworn testimony that he never paid Sasha Visser. It's not correct. I, I, I can't say I'm not inside Mike's head that day. I don't know. 
if he was deliberately untruthful or if he forgot, misunderstood, you know, I, I can't say. I can say that that is not, definitely not correct. We asked Mr. DeGroote if he committed the criminal offense of perjury. He refused to answer, but his lawyers responded, Michael DeGroote is 82 years old and very unwell. They said his ongoing pain and taking many drugs significantly interfere with Mr. DeGroote's cognitive abilities. They had no other explanation for his apparently false testimony. In the last year, Michael DeGroote's glittering casino dream for the Dominican Republic took a very dark turn. There have been vicious threats and counter threats on all sides. In August 2014, a dream casino lawyer named Rafael Castro Mercedes was found murdered in his Dominican home, leading to speculation it was tied to his involvement with the casinos. Last May 15th, Sasha Visser was detained in the Dominican Republic, reportedly in relation to the Castro murder and fraud connected to Dream Corporation. When we left them, the Carboni brothers were fighting a losing battle to hold on to their casinos in the Dominican Republic. Two days after our documentary aired, Antonio Carbone was arrested at the Punta Cana airport and charged with the attempted murder of another Dream Casino official working for the DeGroote faction. Although the evidence is dubious, he remains in prison. I'm here to let you know that I've decided to make a new gift to the Master School of Medicine. That gift will be the amount of $50 million. Michael DeGroote has continued his philanthropic endeavors, which have received widespread applause, but he is clearly worried about the effect of this story on his reputation. When we first wrote to him asking for an interview, he answered, I must respectfully decline your request. Frankly, I sincerely regret that I ever agreed to invest in this venture. Indeed, I am embarrassed by it, especially after a lifetime of growing successful businesses. His embarrassment is understandable. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto.